My name's Ed. I've been on X Factor. I've met Prince Harry. I've sung in front of 120,000 people. Um, I've wrestled a live mountain lion. Mm -hmm. I'm US, prior US military, US Army. So open, and I think that's a big part of it, is I'm so open to not having a hard definition of what m success looks like, mm -hmm. that I'm malleable enough that mm -hmm. life can steer me where I need to go. It's really interesting because I, you know, you never really know how people perceive you. Yes. You think yeah. you're putting yourself out there exactly the way you're putting yourself out there, but every single person through their own filter of life is mm -hmm. perceiving you and what you're saying in, in, in their own way. You always begin with the end in mind. What is the ultimate end that you want to begin with? Mm. And then be honest about where you're at and then connect it, connect your journey between the two. And So today we're with uh, Ed Cunningham, and uh, me and you, crazy enough, met like four days ago. Yep, yeah, at the Joe Polish event. Yeah, and um, man, you have probably one of the, like, by first impressions, one of the craziest stories that I've ever heard of, um, being a fi firefighter and now an entrepreneur too, and just the way that you kind of manage things as far as like your business, as far as your life it's so creative and out of the box. Because I don't think a lot of people would do kind of like what you did. And I, and I hope that sparked enough interest for you to like be able to tell your story and people just be like, oh my God, like who the hell is this guy? Sure. Um, <laughs> so, so tell me about it. Tell me about um, kind of what you're doing right now and like why I say that you're so different. Um, well, you know, it's funny because my mom, my mom uh, once said, uh, she goes, son, your life's the kind of life that you just want to pull out a lawn chair and a margarita and watch. And so, actually, that's the name of the book. I'm writing a book. Oh, okay. It's called Lawn Chairs and Margaritas. And Margaritas, okay. Because uh, when I travel to conferences and speak, um, so I, I mostly speak on recognizing and overcoming the blocks that stand in the way of personal growth and self-mastery. Yeah. And uh, a lot of that comes from how we were raised and the domestication of us into whatever family unit, culture, society, et cetera, that we were grew up yeah. in. Um, I don't know, I've just always, and it, people have always been on me to share my stories, because it's been, it's been kind of a crazy life, and uh, so finally I sat down and, uh, after years of this, and started writing my book. Mm -hmm. So my mom had come up with the title accidentally years ago, and uh, working on that. <coughs> How long have you been doing the, the, the book for? Uh, I've only been writing on it for about four months. Okay. Uh, one of my biggest issues with it was I was worried because a lot of the stories that I talk about deal with the traumas and stuff that I went through as a child, mm -hmm. uh, from the, the drugs that were in the home to uh, abuse to of several kinds of abuse on up to um, just poverty and, and all the things that, that uh, to most people were, I guess, roadblocks to their, their life just mm -hmm. became speed bumps for me. And, oh, uh, interesting. I, I just I just uh, wrote something about about that that um, most people see those things as kind of like a barrier. Yeah. Whereas they're meant to be like if you're driving to a destination, you don't stop because of the speed bump. You have to slow down. Slow down. Yeah. And you go over it. But it, that's funny that we're just kind of in that that same because I've never heard that same example. Most people just say like, oh, it's a hurdle. You got to go over it. You know, and like yeah, and it's that's the truth, man. Because it, it's it all comes down to mentality. It all comes down to how you choose to view everything that happens to you. And mm -hmm. it was uh, Edmund Burke that said uh, the true measure of strength in a man is not how many trials they face, but how they face each individual trial. Yeah. And um, one of my problems with writing the book was I was worried uh, because some of the people that caused the traumas in my life mm -hmm. as a kid uh, are still alive mm -hmm. and doing very well. They've actually overcome their own demons mm -hmm. and are flourishing. And uh, my thing was I don't want to take them back yeah. to the way it was. And I, I've never looked at anything like I was a victim. Yeah. And cause you can't always choose what happens to you, but you can choose who you become because of it mm -hmm. and how you get through it. Yeah. And that's where I focused my entire life on. You know, so you talk about the different odd things that I've done in my life, the crazy things. Um, <laughs> I did a, I'm, I'm single, and I, I did a dating profile 
a couple of years ago. A friend oh, talked me into it. Here it goes. <laughs> so, but I went through and I read everybody's profiles and stuff. And they're like, hi, I'm Todd. I'm a 35-year-old uh, engineer. I have four kids, been divorced seven years, blah, blah, blah. There's like a couple people. Hi, Todd. You know, just the obligatory. Yeah. This, no one's commenting on this guy's stuff, so I need to say something. <clears throat> so I get on there and I'm like, okay, I got to do something different. Just, and I, and I didn't care. I don't take these personally. So I wasn't like I was trying so hard to sell myself. Like some of them write these massive bios. And so I just got on there and I said, my name's Ed. I've been on X Factor. I've met Prince Harry. I've sung in front of 120,000 people. Um, I've wrestled a live mountain lion. Mm -hmm. I'm U.S. prior U.S. military, U.S. Army, uh, and I've. Let's see, what was the other thing? Oh, I own a restaurant. I was a firefighter, and I uh, used to live in Hawaii. And I've been to New York on New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. And that was a list. And I said one of these is a lie. If you could tell me which one, you get a free sub. Mm -hmm. That was my whole <laughs> dating profile. Yeah. And it's true. Only one of those things was a lie. And. Uh, You're gonna tell us which can you, one. Can you guess? Okay, which one? <laughs> I might. Um, geez, I want to say it's the hundred twenty thousand people. Nope, I've done that. You see, but that was I was like I feel like that was. Yeah. I was a singer songwriter in Nashville, actually. Okay, that's what I did for a living. I did demos for the songwriters. I wanted to be an artist. I moved out there for that, but I ended up doing demos for the other songwriters and making money as a singer. But I ended up New singing. Year's Eve. New Year's Eve then. That's the only one. Okay, I've that's never, what I thought. Yeah, I've never been Because you kind of, you, you hesitated a little bit, so I thought that might have been it, yeah. Yeah, I've never, I have, I've yet to be to New York, um, but I've wrestled a live mountain lion. I was in the military. I was a firefighter. Yeah. How and, did you put yourself in those situations? Like, because I, I think that that's something that, like, just so many people, no matter what your age, you, most people feel like, I never lived, right? Right. And you're like quite the opposite. I mean, nobody's gonna nobody's gonna be like, oh, well, he hasn't been to New Year's Eve on New York. You know, like that's the, like the last thing yeah. people are thinking of. How do you put yourself in those situations? You know, um, it's really it's really about being open. Because because to me, I, I I genuinely believe my my personal spiritual belief is that this universe was created to give us whatever we want. Mm -hmm. um, but every time you ask the universe for something or pray for something to your God or, mm -hmm. or ask to be blessed with something, the universe responds first with preparation for that blessing. Mm. And so many people get caught up and stopped by the preparation for the blessing because the truth is, if you receive a blessing, it becomes a curse if you're not prepared for it. Yeah. That's why, what is it, like 60% of the people that win the lottery end up going bankrupt within like six, seven years. Yeah. They weren't prepared for that blessing. They weren't yeah. financially stable to begin with. Now they have a windfall. They keep their spending habits the same way, just on a larger scale, they go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you lose $100 million? How do you... <clears throat> so the first thing the universe does is gives you the preparation, the, the, the trials to go through to strengthen you to be ready for the blessing. And that's it's really how I have viewed everything in my life mm -hmm. is, okay, I know I want something, but I also know there's going to be stuff to go through to get to that. Because yeah. God is not going to give me what I want until I'm prepared for it so that it, it truly becomes a blessing. Um, and I was, I was speaking at a conference once um, about the overcoming blocks and stuff, and I shared my life story. And uh, this guy came up to me afterwards, and it was really interesting because you, know, you never really know how people perceive you. Yes. You think yeah. you're putting yourself out there exactly the way you're putting yourself out there, but every single person through their own filter of life is mm -hmm. perceiving you and what you're saying in, in, in their own way. And he came up and he's like, Mr. Cunningham, I just want to shake your hand. He goes, um, man, you have accomplished so much in your life. Like you've succeeded at everything you've done. Mm -hmm. And I sat there going, I haven't. He goes, well, what do you mean? Like you've been in the military, you've done this, this. And I said, well, each goal that I had, mm -hmm. I began working towards it. But I have yet to fully accomplish the apex of every goal that I've set out for. Mm -hmm. When I joined the U.S. military, I was going to be a lifer. I was going to be in for 20 years. I was going to go officer. You know, I, I wanted to do you know, three to six years, maybe two terms as an enlisted guy. And then I was going to go to OCS. And I had all these plans, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> joined the military. We had a president that gutted the military of finances. Mm -hmm. And it was not fun to be in. Yeah. So I ended up getting out of the military. And uh, my next career was going to be in air conditioning. So mm. I moved back to Phoenix and started working on air conditioning. And then I went to work on drill rigs up in Idaho, uh, just trying to make the money. And for a 21-year-old kid, I was making cheddar, man. Working on yeah. drill rigs is, was great money for me. Um, and then life hit me. 
So I was going to work on drill rigs. Drill rigs, I mean, a driller makes 350K plus a year wow. as the head guy running it. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to become... In this. Idaho, yeah, I mean... <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some bank. Um, but then it was miserable. It was a horrible life. It was a hard life. It was a... The roughneck life isn't easy. So life happens. Mm-hmm. Every goal I've gone towards, something happened that said, no. Not for you. But in working towards that, mm-hmm. I learned more about who I was. Mm-hmm. I learned more about what I do enjoy, what I don't enjoy, what I'm great at, what I'm good at, what I'm okay at and how to take the okays and turn them into what I'm good at. So mm-hmm. how to take the goods and turn that into what I'm best at. <clears throat> uh, ironically enough, I ended up uh, at the age of 22, homeless, uh, living in a car. Wow, that's, that's a big shift. Utterly humiliated. Yeah, my, my first wife had, uh, well, I was in basic training when I got a letter basically saying, hey, I'm having your kid. And it was a, a girl that I had just met mm-hmm. randomly at a party and I had no idea. That's oh, why I moved yeah. to Idaho, actually, was to be around her and oh, okay. try and make things work and do the honorable thing, I guess. Um, but long story short, she found out we were getting divorced. Before I came down from the drill rig, because I was up there for two months at a time, she had blown everything. And so I came down with one paycheck to live on. Wow. And I ended up selling my truck and having to live in a car for about four months to get on my feet. It was humiliating. Uh, I, had, I had had a job since I was eight years old as a paper boy, mm-hmm. and I had always held a job, and so it was, it was a rough go. What, um, was, what was the, the <laughs> difficult part there? What was the issue with, like, finding a job? Was it that in Idaho that was, like, the only... No, it was, uh, and it, this kind of goes back to my philosophy of when you pray for something uh, or ask the universe for something, first the preparation time. comes yeah. first. And I remember I was, it was at the drill rig, and we had taken a break, and I was smoking a lot. I was drinking a lot because they just they paid for all of our tobacco and mm-hmm. our alcohol up there. And and I was, I knew my my marriage wasn't going to work, and I was miserable. Mm-hmm. And I got on my knees and I just said, "Look, God, uh, I don't know what I'm missing. I, I don't know what lesson I haven't learned that hasn't moved me forward. But I feel stuck. I want to be a good man. Mm-hmm. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good father." I want to be good at these things. Yeah. And <clears throat> I said, and I want to do something with my life that matters, not just work on a, a drill rig for the rest of my life, not just work for the money. And for the next two years after that prayer, man, it was, my life was like Job's, you know, in the, in the Old mm. Testament. I would just, I lost everything. And I could, every job I got an offer for, uh, I'd show up and they'd, Sorry, man. We only got about a week's worth of work for you, and we need you to. You know, we don't. We didn't get the contract we thought we were going to, so I wasted money driving, and I wasted money, yeah. you know, putting myself up in that place. And uh, so I ended up living in Utah, uh, in a car. I sold my really nice truck that I had paid off. Bought this little. So you drove from Idaho down to literally Utah chasing to, jobs. Yeah. I went from Salmon, Idaho to Idaho Falls to Logan, Utah, to Orem, Utah, mm-hmm. and it was in Logan that I, I had found a, a sales job for this company. Um, and I was really good at getting up in front of people, so I would, it was a network marketing company mm. called Equinox, and I would, I'd get up and I'd talk about the product, I'd talk about the business, and they'd pay me like 35 bucks cash mm. to do it. So I was, I would have cash every couple of days for yeah. that. Uh, God, I was donating plasma. Uh, I was the, the first white boy in line at the day labor office <laughs> every single day that I had off. I mean, I was there at four in the morning to make sure I got a job. And uh, I didn't care, no job was beneath me. I, I just wanted to work. And it was doing sales at the office in Orem where this guy came up to me after one of the meetings and just started talking to me. He just sat down with me. Uh, and I was honest with him. He asked me what I was doing with my life, uh, where I lived. You know, and I, I told him, I said, I'm living in my car right now, but I'm, I'm getting on my feet. And he's like, really? He's like, well, how many jobs are you working? And I said, four. And so I, I literally would work overnight as security guard, delivery guy during the day come in and do sales for them, go to my security job, bounce around the weekend, donating plasma, and then the day labor stuff. I mean, it was like, oh, and then I sold cars on the weekend too. Wow. Uh, just on the weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, I mm-hmm. would go work at a car dealership for commission only. And uh, his name was Bill Gould, and he was a billionaire that actually owned the company. Mm. And he took an interest in me. And the first book he gave me to read, he gave me a whole list, but he gave me, he made me go buy it as broke as I was. Cause he's like, well, you'll respect it if I make you buy it. I'm not going <laughs> to give it to you for free. <laughs> Cause $9 to me was like a thousand dollars to most people yeah. at that time. Yeah. And it was called the four agreements and it's by uh, Don Miguel Ruiz. 
and it completely changed my life. It changed how I saw myself, how I saw how I was raised, and it made me take ownership over where my life was going to go. Mm -hmm. And within seven years of me sitting down to read that book, I was doing very well in the music industry, doing what I loved in Nashville. And it was just, it, it, the blessing couldn't come until I had asked for, until I had been humbled enough and pride, you know, and, and my yeah. pride stripped away enough that I'd be willing to turn back and say, okay, what do I have to do? Yeah. It undid all that programming of what a man should be and what a, guy, what a, what a husband should be and what a father should be. And it stripped all that away. And I started over from scratch and said, okay, what is true? And how do I live my life by that? And it took you to, to who you should be more than what you mm -hmm. thought you should be. Completely broke me down. And I built myself back up with some help of some amazing mentors. You can't do it on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether that was through books or in person, I was very blessed to have some amazing uh, men and women mentor me over the years. Yeah. And to be able to turn around and, and do it again. So again, with that guy telling me, hey, you know, man, you've been successful at everything you've been. Everything I worked towards, I didn't make it to the apex. I never became an officer. I never became a driller. I never succeeded all the way in sales in that one company that I was working at. Mm -hmm. Even in Nashville, I have a couple published songs and one that made it to album, but nothing that's ever done huge. You yeah. know, nothing that's ever been what people would consider a success in the music industry. But it was all amazing experiences. Um, unfortunately, uh, in Nashville, we had something pretty devast devastating happen to one of our kids, and uh, actually to the whole family. And it was, uh, it was one of those moments where it's like, okay, do we stay in Nashville where we have good friends or do we move back home where we have family? Mm -hmm. And we had just sold one of the companies. Uh, so our house was paid for, cars were paid for, and we had a little nest egg. And uh, we moved back here. And the blessing of that one company selling allowed me to take about a year and a half off and just focus on my son and, and uh, my daughter and my, uh, the rest of the kids. And, and my wife and just work on putting our little family back together. Yeah. Uh, it was about a year and a half after we moved back here that a buddy of mine, uh, his name's Chad, is a captain with Buckeye Fire, said, you know, hey, why don't you come do a ride along? I think you'd be a good firefighter, come do a ride along. And I'll be honest, man, uh, emotionally, I wasn't ready to start a business again or, or, or get back into it. And being a firefighter was something I had always considered. So I did. Um, I loved it, did the ride along, uh, got my EMT, got it, hired onto the ambulance, the Southwest Ambulance here, mm -hmm. and began working on the AMBO, um, started doing ride alongs with fire departments and went to the academy, got my paramedic, and I had gotten picked up by Buckeye as a reserve uh, for a couple years, and then I got picked up by El Mirage for uh, nine years, mm -hmm. and uh, no, it was, it was a great career, but towards... You know, getting up there to the 10-year mark, I was uh, starting to look at businesses. I was, you know, mm -hmm. healthy emotionally and mentally and uh, was in a good place again. My family was doing great. My wife had started a new job, you know, as a nurse. And, like, everybody was doing good. And it yeah. was like, all right, it's time to take care of me. Yeah. And that's a whole story in and of itself. Well, you, you, like, it's the same thing, right? Same story, just a different time again. You were getting ready for the, you were getting prepared for, for, for something what was bigger. Yeah. And I didn't, you know, at the time, I, I didn't feel it, you know, because people, when they, see, when they see someone that's achieved success, they tend to go, you know, oh, man, look, at, they were born into it, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, you know, look how they, they got so lucky. Yeah. Um, they don't see the work, the preparation, the tears, the sweat, the blood that goes into achieving something bigger than, than you were when you started. Yeah. Um, I mean, with all that, like, the, the biggest thing that I feel like with like especially with what I'm doing is uh, the shame and embarrassment that people don't see because it's like a lot of the times like as men I feel that we can take the um, the the hit of like ah you know frustration and anger and everything but when you when you're building something and then you're just like damn that sucks it failed oh, or that God. didn't work you know what I mean or like damn I literally told a thousand people we were gonna do this and this guy screwed me over and you're just like what the hell do I do now? You oh, know, I like, got some stories about that, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that right there, I can only imagine when people tell me, like, I've had success, and I'm like, what have you gone through? Just like you were saying, you have stories. I'm sure that you're like, this person just, or like, this situation, oh, God, you know, like, so tell me one, tell me one. That, and... 
Um, man, I'm trying to think who I want to throw under the bus and who I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, I'm here. I'll, I'll just we'll just talk candidly, and uh, I guess if, if people get upset about it, they get upset about it. Um, so in in the middle, my 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 wife and I'm divorced now. Mm-hmm. Um, going through a trial like we went through with mm-hmm. our family is devastating to people individually, mm-hmm. the whole family. Putting us back together w- was rough. And uh, simply put, our, our marriage really didn't survive that. Mm-hmm. Uh, people look at, at my restaurant. It's, it was uh, ranked number one in the entire system of all open firehouse subs. There were around 1,240 open. Yeah. And we were ranked number one in the system, actually by a really large margin usually between store two and store 20 is about a one percentage. And we were two to three percentage points higher than restaurant number two mm-hmm. in some areas. In one area, we were 38 percentage points higher than restaurant number two, wow. which had been unheard of. Yeah, uh, We were a million dollar producing store the first year, actually almost 1.4 million in sales, mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, which, is, which is fantastic. Uh, but what people don't know is it took me six years to get there. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I went to do it, and uh, we didn't really have the finances, and because of some things that had happened, we weren't able to use the finances we thought we could. Then, so I started a small business building and restoring and repurposing things. I bought at auction to try mm-hmm. to save money. Yeah. Uh, and then we made a couple smart real estate decision moves, um, and then we got separated. And then everybody's like, what are, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't. But I was dead set on opening this restaurant. I was gonna. I was not gonna give up or lose one more dream, because yeah. of a not great marriage, uh, yeah. or because of, of life. Like I was going to make this one happen, and uh, about, gosh, I was like four months before we were supposed to open. Um, found out that the paperwork hadn't been done that was supposed to have been done by the person that said they had done the paperwork, mm-hmm. who was supposed to be my partner. So, uh, my cousin and I, Stephanie, a lot of people, see, she's at the restaurant all the time, actually went over there and got all the paperwork from their house and took it to my house. And me and, and uh, my cousin Stephanie and my son Joe did about nine months of work in four months. And wow. we finally got it open. So, I hold, the rec- I hold, I hold several records with Firehouse <laughs> Subs. Uh, you know, being able to hit number one in just five months, being able to do, you know, be a, a million dollar producer in, in, in the first year and, and, and blow that away, you know, at almost 1.4. And then uh, I also hold the record for it taking the longest <laughs> to open a restaurant. Okay. Most people that, take yeah. up to a year, maybe two years at the most. And yeah. I was at almost six years wow. I had been a franchisee working on getting a restaurant getting a open. Restaurant. Wow. And man, there was some bad real estate deals that got in the way of that. Just mm, I bet, yeah. horrible commercial realtors that were involved. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I have yet to meet, I'm not saying they're not out there, but I've yet to meet a friendly landlord, mm. uh, especially here in the surprise area. For some reason, every landlord I've met so far, again, there might be one out there, I'd be happy to meet you if, <laughs> if, you, if you're out there, uh, that actually cared about their tenants. That's, that's good information because we're looking pretty soon to like expand. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and now that I'm thinking about that, I'm like, well, maybe a surprise isn't the best place, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I, I can't tell you, I have helped several business owners that were at uh, contention with their landlords uh-huh. uh, fight it out and win mm. uh, just because landlords can scare you, man. You, yeah. you sign that personal notice, that personal guarantee, and, you know, they're like, I'm taking your house. I'm, and I'm like, they're not going to do that. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it's, it, it can be scary, especially when you, as an entrepreneur, put everything you have on the yeah. line for something you believe in. Yeah. That you know if I just get past this hump, I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. And you risk so much. And these landlords, who are, a lot of them are extremely, extremely wealthy people. This is just chump change or a tax write-off to them. Uh, they know that. They know you're strapped. They know yeah. you're scared. And they use that against you. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a world we live in, right? But um, I actually wanted to say, I know since you're a spiritual man, um, with the stuff that you were going through, it, it reminds me a lot. I think it was Nehemiah where, where I read it that it said um, when you're building something or like when people come to attack you, you got to build and attack at the same time, right? Because yeah. it's like I forgot who was attacking and I think it was like Israel they were attacking them, but they would attack by day and then they would rest at night. 
So while they were attacking the walls at day, they had a fight, and then at night they had to they be had like to building. Build. So it was like it was like fight and build, fight and build, fight and build, and it's like, geez, that's like how life is, you know? Like it's how business is. Seems yeah, like. yeah. It's like the moment that you you stop, like you said, taking the money from one place. And you stop doing that, all of a sudden, it's like your money starts running out. So it's like you got to take the money over here while still working on this over here. And that's why, like, when I first started this, I didn't know how to explain who you were. Because you're, I mean, who are you? Well, I'm, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm just a guy that makes sa- that makes sandwiches, man. I'm, I'm just. No, that, that, you're, <laughs> that's where you're at now, right? What were you before that, right? Because that, that's not where you're going to end either. No. And I, I you know, it's, it's funny because I, I. Most of the stuff that I do, I don't, I don't really plan on it. I just go, this is where I'm going, and along the way, I end up getting to do some really cool things. I, I'm so open, and I think that's a big part of it, is I'm so open to not having a hard definition of what m- success looks like mm-hmm. that I'm malleable enough that mm-hmm. life can steer me where I need to go. You know, gotcha. so many people, you know, and, and I'll, a perfect example are some friends of mine that are doctors. You know, they got, they spent you know, seventy, eighty thousand dollars just getting into medical school. Yeah. Just to get to the point where they could go to medical school and they, they they're like, Ed, I hate this. Mm-hmm. I hate the medical industry. I don't like this at all. I don't want to be a part of it. And I'm like, then quit. You know, go change your major. I can't. I'm eighty thousand dollars in debt. There's no way I could ever get another job without starting college all over again and doubling that anyways, that's yeah. gonna pay what a doctor pays. And so they end up miserable for the rest of their lives instead of going, hey, I just paid eighty thousand dollars to learn what I don't like. Yeah. And and kind of be happy and, and grateful for it. And they continue on in a miserable career that they hate and they're never good at, they're never great at what they do. Yeah. You have to be malleable. Yeah, it it baffles me that so many people do that and then they look back at being sixty, sixty five and go, Oh well, what did I do with my life? And it's yeah. the system's fall and like you said, this guy got lucky. Yeah. And um, I, I mean, I hear it all the time, the people that when I tell them like, oh, we do YouTube and everything. Oh, well, you know, that's never going to work. People don't make money on that. And then mm-hmm. two weeks later, I hear the same person say, oh, this guy on YouTube making $2 million. I could have, I could do this. And, you know, yeah. and it, it's just they take all the opportunities that they have for granted um, with you. Where do you want to be, though? Like, do you have like something that you want to do right now? Um. As far as like goals to accomplish or like where do I want to be? Because I do have my three, five and 10 year goals. And yeah. I have, <clears throat> so my dream is actually I'm, I'm, I am three years into my 10 year goal. So I have seven years okay. left. And at the end of, in seven years from now, I'm going to completely restructure my life and I'm either going to sell everything mm-hmm. uh, or if I, if my companies are running well enough, I'll just uh, train someone to take over. And I'm buying a really large boat, mm-hmm. and I'm going to spend about two and a half years sailing the world. Nice. And just visiting, yeah. uh, doing philanthropy. Um, I love service. I love the idea of service. I, I, I truly, <clears throat> the idea of abundance is one of the things that a lot of business owners lack. And we, because like you said, you know, we, we get into that, that, that role of I've, I've robbed Peter to pay Paul. Mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm strapped with cash and we run from fear and so we feel scarce we feel like yeah. we're living in scarcity and so we start viewing the world and people and business and and life like and even relationships like it's all scarcity and in scarcity you reach out and go in order for me to have someone else has to lose mm-hmm. or i have to take from someone else and people constantly think about business that way even if living even if you have scarcity in some things in your life you don't have to live with the scarcity mentality. Understanding abundance. Uh, somebody once said to me, um, you know, oh my gosh, Salad and Go is opening up in your parking lot. And there's mm-hmm. that Polynesian place, it's open, Hawaiian Ono is opening mm-hmm. up. And you know, then there's that, that it, Tacos Khalif is gonna be opening up and all in the same, you know, aren't you scared? And I, no, no, I, I love it. There's plenty of success for all of us out there. There's plenty of money, there's plenty of success. Mm-hmm. There's plenty of business. And it, it's, I, I started what <laughs> eventually, affectionately became known as the restaurant mafia, which is uh, some of the restaurant owners and GMs of the larger ones here in the Surprise area in Northwest Valley, uh, where we get together and talk. Mm -hmm. And we compare, uh, what is Cisco charging you? What is Cisco charging you for the (laughs) same thing? Well, wait a minute, they're charging me double. And Mm -hmm. so we can help each other on prices. Uh, We talk about uh, customers that that purposely try and steal from you. Mm 
Mm. Uh, and it, it's crazy enough, but we know we have all have lists of these names of, and it, it's a very, very few people that do this, but they actually had a Facebook page mm -hmm. where if it was easy to complain to a restaurant and get free food, they would all talk about how to do it. Go mm -hmm. in there and say this, and this is how you get free food, and make sure wow. this manager's on duty because they're the, the biggest pushovers and are yeah. scared of conflict. And if you yell at them, they'll give you more. And I mean, it was crazy what these people were doing. Um, but part of this restaurant mafia were a couple sub shops. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we wanted to do as part of this group was to teach each other what we were good at. And that's why I started it was because I was friends with multiple business owners and because I wanted to learn. I had never run a restaurant before. And I had, you know, Mario from State 48 was, was great at back of the house and, and inventory and, and whatnot. And Jen Campbell from Vogue was great at employees and keeping the motivation up. And, and I mean, there's so many other people that were great at their things. And I was feeding from them. You know, they were feeding me this great, valuable information that I was applying to my restaurant that was helping me be successful. And I thought, you know what? I need to introduce all of them. Mm -hmm. Like, they need to meet each other. Because I, I felt selfish that I was getting all this great knowledge, but none of them knew each other. Yeah. So we started getting together, totally open forum. Someone had once even suggested and said, well, <clears throat> what if we do just one fast casual, you know, or only one sub shop, one Mexican restaurant, one... You know, and I was like, no, no, this is open to everybody. If anybody wants to be a part of it, as long as they're a healthy part of it, can be a part of it. Yeah. So we had other sub shop owners that I would stand up and talk about social media marketing because mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I excelled at was, was the, the how to get the most out of your like Facebook profiles and how to actually uh, create uh, marketing dollars for free uh, through social media. And, you know, Again, people are like, I can't believe you're doing that. These are your competitors. Yeah. I was like, no, nah, they're my partners. I mean, we're all in this community together. And I, I love Surprise. I absolutely love the city of Surprise. I've, I've lived out here and I've worked out here uh, for a very long time. And uh, I mean, I used to hunt out here. I used to camp out here. My family's been in the valley since the 1950s. Yeah. And uh, we grew up out here. And to watch it grow into what it has, I want to see all of the businesses here in Surprise adopt the idea of abundance and cooperation mm -hmm. and understand that there's there's plenty out there. Yeah. And because of that, I think uh, a lot of us actually refer business back and forth to each other. Mm. You know, I, I've, I've eaten at other sub shops and actually done a selfie uh, <laughs> in the sub shop and promoted them. Wearing my Firehouse Subs shirt, yeah. I've promoted another sub shop and the owners especially of, of who's in there. Um, that's what I'm hoping to see more of, but. Yeah. See, when, when uh, people start businesses, they understand the concept, well, they're starting to understand the concept, I should say, they're still the, the old school business owners, but of having employees, because this employee can bring this, and this employee mm -hmm. can bring this, right? Absolutely. But you took it a step above, which most people don't, which is your competition and the people that are around you, they are good at stuff too. And if you're all able to learn from each other, I mean, it's. I don't think anybody who is like a real type of business owner minds the competition. No. Nope. You know, it, the thing is that like, if you really aren't good at it, you aren't good at it, so you don't belong. And the people who are good at it know like, if you're good at it, then me and you have no problem. We're just gonna, right. we're gonna, you know, find a way we're to make it work. Exactly. Together. Yeah, we're gonna take the guy who doesn't know what he's doing and that person's not gonna, you know? So, yeah, just, I mean, since I've met you, like the mentality that you have is absolutely beyond and I mean, it, I, I can't think of a better way to end it, but the company that you have now, right? The, the decontamination the business. Decontamination. Um, I view Another this, accident. <laughs> I, I view this, though, as like something that was a calling for you that you like. couldn't turn down. And that, you know, it's, it's funny because, and I'm, I'm not kidding, when I first looked into Firehouse Subs, I tried to talk myself out of it. Mm -hmm. And I just kept feeling like this is where life kept pushing me, pushing me, pushing me. So mm -hmm. I finally gave in and said, I'm going to do it. I did it. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people don't know, but um, cancer is the number one killer of firefighters. Mm -hmm. It passed heart disease roughly around five years ago. Um, and we're even finding out that a lot of what we thought was heart disease was actually some of the toxins like arsenic and cyanide that were causing heart attacks for firefighters. Mm -hmm. uh, so years ago, when this really first started coming to light, it was my honor guard and I would go to Colorado Springs every year in September for the Fallen Firefighter Memorial. And we kept noticing that the names that were going on the wall 
increasingly were cancer, 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 mm -hmm. cancer, cancer, cancer. And we, it started becoming a problem. We just started kind of talking about it in the industry. <clears throat> and so my chief had come to me and a, a couple other guys and said, I want you to create the toxic mitigation program for our department. And so I, I, I went to work. One of the biggest things that, that was a little bit of a mind shift for us in, in the, the fire service was understanding that most of our contamination doesn't actually come from the fire itself. Mm -hmm. It comes from our gear mm -hmm. after the fire. Our gear does a really good job protecting us while we're in there, but when we come out, we immediately come off air and our stuff is off-gassing VOCs like crazy. We start taking our gear off, now it's all over our skin. We go over to the utility truck and we grab a Gatorade bottle, pop it off, and now we're ingesting it in, you know, into our digestive tract. I mean, we are exposing ourselves like crazy because of our gear. And so my goal was, I, and Stephen Covey says it best when he says, you always begin with the end in mind. What is the ultimate end that you want to begin with? Mm. And then be honest about where you're at and then connect it, be, connect your journey between the two. And the ultimate would be, how do we detoxify our gear before we even come off air? Part of the problem is, is, is most of us, we're gung-ho, we're type A personalities, we, we fight the fight until the job's done, and we come out with just a little bit of air left in our bottles. Mm -hmm. I mean, our, our bells are ringing saying, hey, you're less than 10%. Um, and so it had to be quick, because we do have decom procedures, but it, it would take like 15, 20 minutes and an entire hazmat incident and mm -hmm. whatnot, which it truly is a hazmat incident now. Uh, <clears throat> so I developed this kit, and at the time, there's two main cleaners that most of the industry has been using, and there's one that's a citrus-based one and then dish soaps. Mm -hmm. Those are the two main cleaners that everyone uses, but no one's ever asked, do they actually work? Mm -hmm. How well do they work? Do they actually remove the stuff like they say they do? And what about detoxifying our gear? Everybody's worried about cleaning and removing two or three of the contaminants. Me, I'm like, I want to remove as many contaminants as humanly possible, and I don't want to flush them down the drain and kill the environment. Mm -hmm. I don't want to flush them into our water treatments plants and get everyone else sick when it, you know, is, is finally put back in the river. There's nothing in our water treatment system that takes care of the carcinogens and stuff either. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think it was possible. I couldn't find anything out there. <clears throat> um, I built the toxic mitigation program, or at least a, a decent idea of it, with this version of a kit in my head that we carried on our engine. We, uh, the restaurant had been open about a year, and I went back and, uh, to everybody and said, hey, how far have you guys gotten? What are you working on now? I'm like, well, we really haven't done a lot more. We're still using the kit. We're still doing this, but you know, we haven't done much. And I said, well, let's, let's finish. And at yeah. this time, I had already I had retired, so I wasn't actually on the job. But... Um, so my idea was, hey, let's get together with some of the local business owners here in Surprise. Uh, let's have a lot of fun. Let's raise some money. Let's raise some awareness for cancer in the fire service. Let's make 30 of these kits and mm -hmm. donate them to the local fire departments to kickstart their programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a fun thing to do uh, that, that needed to be done. So I did quite a few news interviews uh, talking about it, talking about cancer in the fire service, talking about... Uh, the need for this, talking, you know, just bringing awareness to it and how important it is. <clears throat> and um, I get a phone call from a guy, and he says, uh, his name was Joe, and he says, hey, uh, saw your interview, and uh, we're curious what you're using for your compound. And I said, well, I'm kind of stuck between, you know, the citrus-based stuff and this dish soap, but I don't think they work. There's no proof, there's nothing out there that shows that they really do what we need okay. to do. And I know neither of them do anything to detoxify. And the guy goes, hey, I'd like to talk to you. And he goes, we, we got a company, and some of the work we do is classified, but we'd love to talk to you about it. So they're headquartered in Scottsdale. Drove out and met with them. And about 20 years ago, the federal government reached out. When I was in the military, we had this stuff called DF-100. It, mm -hmm. it was our decon fluid. And it was... <clears throat> For lack of a better term, it was battery acid. I mean, it was okay. just this horrible caustic stuff that would eat away at your skin if you got it on you. But mm -hmm. it was like, do I die of mustard gas or melt my skin off and live? Yeah. <clears throat> horrible stuff. Um, they had put out this, this list to, of like a shopping list to, to chemists all across the U.S. and said, we need a compound that's non-toxic, that's non-caustic, that can destroy stuff as harsh as mustard gas, sarin gas, and you know, biologicals like anthrax and whatnot. And um, uh, uh, Dr. Tucker at Sandia Labs in New Mexico invented this product that became known as DF200. Mm. And it was a two-part compound. <clears throat> um, 
millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars spent on research and development of this compound. Uh, for the last 18 years, the FBI, the CIA, Secret Service, and the Center for Disease Control have used this compound as their decon fluid. Yeah. So, um, met with them. They actually, when it was declassified three years ago and allowed for private sale, uh, Dr. Tucker got the licensing rights, started his own small business, and added a third part to the compound, which increased the uh, oxidizing effects of mm -hmm. the, the second part, um, almost a hundredfold. It's, it's absolutely amazing what it can do now. Um, and packaged it for the food industry. So they actually, for the last three years, have been focusing on decontaminating oh, okay. about 70% of the food processing plants in America. And they're worldwide now. The, the company has gone huge. They're actually in China using the compound to take care of the bubonic plague outbreak in there. Mm -hmm. Amazing stuff. So uh, this company donated to the first 30 kits. They donated enough product for the first 30 kits. And uh, we did this big day of donation, had a bunch of news stations there. I think we had five news stations. Did a whole bunch of interviews that they've cut and used over months. Um, and then I went back to running the restaurant. I was actually getting ready to do a second restaurant. And <laughs> about three weeks later, uh, Firehouse Subs Corporate calls. And uh, they're like, what the heck are you doing out there? <laughs> and I go, why? What do you mean? They're like, we're getting phone calls and emails asking for the Firehouse Subs decon kit. Because I had done all my interviews on my Firehouse mm. Subs shirt at the restaurant. And I was like, oh, shoot. Well, just send, my, send in my email address uh, or give them my phone number or whatever. And I'll sit down with whatever department's calling. And I'll help them put together their own kit. And um, <laughs> the manufacturer who manufactures the compound calls me up the same week and says, hey, Ed, we got to talk. And so the cool thing is, is one of the main owners, one of the biggest investors, is retired LAPD. Okay. Uh, Joe Drake is his name. Fantastic gentleman. Uh, has also been a mentor of mine. And uh, he had always wanted to bring this to the fire side, to the public service side, mm -hmm. because it was originally created for toxic exposures on the front line. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of money, and it was a little bit easier, I guess, to get into the food industry, which is why they went that way to begin with. But they had always wanted to bring it over to the fire side, especially. And um, he said, look, man, we've been getting emails, phone calls, talking about your kit. Um, we, we think you should do this as a business. And I went, oh, no, no, <laughs> man, I, I can't do it as a business. I am getting ready to open a second restaurant. My first restaurant's going gangbusters. I, 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 don't, I don't have time. And he goes, Ed, this is going to completely change the fire industry worldwide. He goes, it's needed. You need to do it as a business. He goes, so what we're going to do is we're going to give you licensing rights to it so that you can sell to first responders, and we're going to private label it for you as well. And it became known as the True Decon Compound, T-R-U Decon, the True Decon Compound. Um, and so I, I prayed about it, talked with my cousin who's helping me in the restaurant and said, yeah, you're going to have to kind of run the restaurant without me as, as much. I'm not going to be able to be in here that much. And, uh, she agreed, um, to, you know, be a bigger part of that. And my, my son as well, my son, Joe helps with the restaurant. Uh, and my dad was like, I'll help you with, you know, the decomp business too. And, um, I've had several firefighters and police officers step up and say, no, we're in this with you. Um, yeah. We're going to help with, with sales and everything. So I put my restaurant up against an SBA loan and I got a warehouse here in Surprise and we started fulfilling orders. And it, it's, been, it's been very fascinating mm -hmm. because the number one obstacle I have faced in getting this, this literally life-changing and uh, industry-altering product out there has been pride and ego. So I'll, I'll tell you one quick story, and this, this will blow your mind, because obviously you hear about it everywhere. It's on the news. I mean, Chicago Fire just did a, an episode the other day talking about mm -hmm. decon procedures, talking about cancer at the fire service. And um, I'm not going to say which city, but I met with a city, and uh, the guy that was over the health and safety department is sitting down at the end of the table. So I got the fire chief, police chief, city manager, uh, even the water department was there, and the guy that's part of the labor, the union side, the health and safety committee, is sitting down at the end, didn't ask a single question, didn't say a single word during my whole, my whole presentation about what this is and what we're doing and, and how it's different. And uh, afterwards, um, you know, everything went great, but I, I pulled him aside. I said, dude, they're looking at you for the decision here. Like, this is your baby. Like, you didn't ask a single question. And he goes, well, he goes, shit, man. He goes, I'm... I just spent the last nine months working on our toxic mitigation program. He goes, and, you know, everyone else is using, like, Dawn dish soap. And I was just going to, I had already recommended, like, a couple weeks ago that we just use, 
the, the Florida kits is what they're calling them because Florida has gone off using mm -hmm. dish soap and a brush and a bucket, and they're calling it decon. Um, and he's like, I recommended that. And now you come in and you say, this is where we need to be. And, and I said, yeah. And he goes, he goes I'm going to look like an idiot. He goes, if I recommend your product, that's me telling the chief that I just wasted the last nine months, the overtime I charged him when I was at home doing research. And I go, you charged him for overtime? Why? Like, all you did was Google. Well, yeah, man, but, you know, he was so worried yeah. that he was going to look like a, a schmuck that Versus he wasn't going to recommend what yeah. we're doing. And, and I've, I've run into that, believe it or not, as crazy as it sounds, I've run into that about 50% of the departments I've met with. Every department's proactive mm -hmm. and looking for something. But then they're doing something and they're patting each other on the back and going, oh, yeah, we, we got dish soap. We're great. We're great. Okay, we can go back to ignoring this again like we did for so many years. Yeah. And I come along and say, no, you're not only not cleaning hardly, you're only, yes, you're removing some contaminants. And that's the problem is, is the word decon, the definition that's accepted is the removal and slash or detoxification. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I mean, I've been meeting with legislators, um, talking to different committees about passing legislation that removes that slash in the or mm -hmm. and defines decon mm -hmm. as the removal and detoxification. Because that's what we need. The problem is, is nobody has set a bar. I'm mm -hmm. setting a bar. I'm setting the bar and I'm fully exceeding the bar of anything that's out there. Yeah. But no departments are really setting a bar and saying, again, beginning with the end in mind, they're not. They're just mm -hmm. saying, okay, we're doing something. Yeah. So let's pat each other on the back and be happy with that. And it, it has been pride and ego. It's pride and ego that's killing us. It's pride and ego that's going to keep killing us yeah. until we get out of our own way as it an must, industry. It must be tough for you to care when others don't. I'll, t I'll tell you what. I've learned a long time ago, and this is one of the, the hardest things because we're domesticated to be this way by our parents, is to not take anything personally. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm passionate. I'm passionate. And I'm going to personally put myself into that passion and into this, into this initiative uh, but when somebody says, no, thank you, I respect their decision. Mm -hmm. Even if I know it's a bad decision. The hardest time to do that is as a parent, but it's yeah. also sometimes tough to do that in business. Yeah. You know, to go, look, I just literally showed you something that can change your life mm -hmm. and will save lives. And them to go, yeah, we're going to stick with uh, the stuff we use to wash oh, our dishes. Yeah. You go, okay, cool, next. Yeah. You, you move on. Um, you know, you, you, you can't do that. So, you know, even with the, with the business, I mean, Google reviews and Yelp reviews, most business owners are petrified of Google and Yelp reviews. I love them. Mm -hmm. They're especially, they hate the negative ones. I love them. I don't want them, but I love dealing with those customers. Yeah. Because uh, to me, if once you get that customer on board, once you understand, once they understand who you are and what you're really doing, they're going to be your, your customer for life. Absolutely. Yeah, hate, hate is one of those great indicators that um, it, people will tell you, and it's usually less times, but like people will tell you if they do like something, right? And it's easy for everybody to like say, hey, you know, you're doing a good job. When somebody says or, that they don't like you, that something was really wrong. And they must have felt really passionate about that. Unless it's those people that are trying to obviously get like free food, you know? But, sure. but, but And those people are so rare, but they do yeah. exist. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you, and this, this is a cool story, and I, I tell every one of my employees, when I hire an employee... Uh, I sit down with them for about an hour before they even start, and I give them an expectations talk, and I tell them stories about how we serve people. Um, customers don't always tell you what they need. They, they do have no problem telling you what they want. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting inside one day, or I, I can't remember, I was wiping off the table, and I, I'm always scanning the restaurant, making sure customers are happy and talking to each other and enjoying their time. And this lady is sitting out with a group of about five other people around a table outside, and she's all, come here, right? And so and you could tell she was angry. So I walk outside and I say, yes, ma'am, you know, can I help you? And she goes, you charged us for an extra sandwich. And I said, I apologize for that. I absolutely apologize. I said, at your convenience, whenever you're done, no hurry, come on in and I'll refund that to you. And she goes, oh, no, 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 you're refunding the entire ticket. So there were six people that all ordered like large subs. It was over a $120 order mm -hmm. for everything because they got the sides, they got... And I, I said, ma'am, I, I appreciate that, but I'm, I'm not going to, you know, was everybody's sandwich is okay? And everybody's like, yeah, everybody's fine. It's like, I'm not going to refund the entire ticket just for that. Um, if you want, I can give you a dessert, you know, to make up for the inconvenience of it. And I, have, I apologize again for, for that happening. I get that you're upset about it. And I'd like to make it right, but, you know, I'm not going to refund the entire order. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're refunding at least half. And I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm not going to do that, but I'd be glad to give you guys desserts for the inconvenience of it. Apologize. And I'll even package up that sandwich, the extra sandwich that came out for you to go. And you, you can, 
you can take that home. You know, again, I absolutely apologize for that. And she goes, well, he paid. And so she, the poor guy sitting next to her is like, Rev is, you know, he's like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll be in in a minute. I was like, oh, sir, at your convenience, thank you. So I, I went back in. Um, he came in, he apologized and said, look, she's having a really bad day. Don't, she's not normally like this. Like, just cut her some slack. And I said, absolutely, man. I say, I get, I'm not taking it personally. I don't, I don't take it personally. I get that there's probably something bigger going on because most people don't, don't treat other people like that. Refunded his stuff. You know, again, I brought the desserts out, made sure everybody was okay. And I, I waited. I kept watching until they started to break up. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to make sure she left my restaurant having had at least a better experience than, than what she had came in with. And I walked out and I said, I, I said, ma'am, I just I caught her alone. You know, everybody was kind of, mm-hmm. and I said, I, I just want to make sure you're not leaving here with any ill feelings. I said, I, I appreciate you coming in. I'm really sorry about the inconvenience of that. Uh, is there anything else I can do for you? And she just starts crying. And she says, she goes, I just found out about an hour before I came here that my son's cancer has come back. And this time it's terminal. It's, he's now a stage four. It's, it's everywhere. And she's like, I'm going to lose him. And uh, uh, I, I just held her. Mm-hmm. I just sat there and I held her while she cried. And what she needed was to connect. Yeah. What she needed was all that pent-up negative energy she had inside of herself where she was angry at God or angry at life or, or angry at something. She needed to release that energy. And she just happened to pick the one weird thing that had gone wrong, which was an overcharge on a sandwich, and she wanted to take it out on me. Mm-hmm. Now, because what I could have done, what a lot of people do, is go, you know, I'm, that's stupid. Why would you ever ask me for, I'm not doing that. And they'd get angry back and they'd match her energy. Instead, I, I didn't receive her energy. I just kind of deflected it and said, it's not, I can't do that. But I will give you what you need. Mm-hmm. And I made sure of that because really what she needed more than anything was a hug. Yeah. She needed to connect. She needed to feel like she had every right to be angry at something, mm-hmm. but what she was really angry at. So I hugged her, held her, talked with her for a little bit, and she left, and she's become one of our, our most loyal customers. And if you, if you can apply that customer service, because I know we didn't get to talk much about the social media aspect and the marketing on there, but my best marketing that I do mm-hmm. isn't on purpose. But it's because I believe in internal and external customer service. External customers are anyone that sees your product. And your product, we only have two products at Firehouse Subs. We have great food, high quality food, and we have the feeling and the experience of eating at a Firehouse Subs. Those are our two products. Mm -hmm. And our job is to make everybody have a great feeling of coming into Firehouse Subs and experiencing eating and knowing that part of their money goes back to help fire police, uh, EMS, and military. but when you extend that level of customer service and teach your employees to give that same service to each other, mm-hmm. they become your best marketers. Because when your clients come in, when your customers come in, they're going to be the ones, if they're having a great customer experience themselves, they're going to share that with the customers that come in. Yeah. D- almost by default. Yeah. They're going to talk about it at social media. It, it's gotten to the point where, and I try and explain how huge of a money savings this is for a business. You don't want to do it for the money, but the side effect of it is um, we don't ever have to put out that we're looking for a job. Mm-hmm. We have a file folder filled with applications of people that want to work at our restaurant. Um, and we usually tell people, you can't work here without one of the employees referring you. Mm-hmm. And we put the responsibility of creating a great work environment on the employees. We tell them, hey, our job as the leaders, you know, you take that that pyramid they have where the CEO or the owner's yeah. up at the top and everyone's below the owner, and we flip that around. My job as the owner of the company is to support and serve the people, my managers that work directly with me. Their job is to be empowered enough to support and serve the rest of the employees in doing their jobs. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, it's a different paradigm shift than what most, uh, self-serve, most um, service businesses are like. It's usually the, the GM and the managers are mm-hmm. the, you know, the awesome people and they look down on everyone else. I completely, it's, it's the opposite. And because of that, my employees like working there. Not that we don't have our breakdowns, mm-hmm. but they like coming to work. They like being there. They even come in on their days off sometimes and just hang out mm-hmm. and help. Um, and they only bring the best people to work there. They have friends ask them all the time, hey man, can you get me a job there? No. Mm-hmm. No. I love you. You're my friend. I love hanging out. You're my homie, but you don't know how to work. 
Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I go there to work. Yeah. And, Absolutely. Uh, so yeah. No, no, I'm I'm glad that you you shared all that stuff with us. I mean, I I I, I was really excited before you came because I knew there was so much more to you than, and that's why like I didn't even ask you a lot of these questions prior to then because I was like I'm I'm gonna need to learn some stuff too. Um, but we are kind of like right at the, the, I think we went actually over by sure. quite a bit, <laughs> but, um, I'm, I'm sure that everybody's going to really enjoy it. I mean, I definitely enjoyed your story as well. Um, final thought or anything that you'd like to say before we kind of close it up? Um, no, I mean, we, we should definitely do this again. Yeah. Um, I, I love, we could spend an hour or two just talking about how to get, how to get the most out of free social media marketing, mm -hmm. uh, especially for small businesses. That's priceless. Local retail marketing is so expensive. Um, but if anyone has any questions uh, and would like to, to reach out um, mm -hmm. to me, uh, I do do business consulting and coaching. Um, it's mostly I like doing it here locally because I'm so busy. It's hard for yeah. me to travel anymore. Um, I have been booked for a couple conferences, but even those, I, I have not been accepting a lot lately mm -hmm. um, just because of the time crunch with the decon. So no, man, we're, we're, at, the, we're at the end right now. Um, final thought before we let you go. Um, yeah, well, I'd, I'd just like to let everybody know if anyone has any questions or, or, uh, or needs or uh, wants to know more about the book, wants to know more about uh, what we're, we're doing, I'd be glad to help them out. I do do uh, business mentoring mm -hmm. uh, and coaching, but I, I don't, I've taken very few clients lately uh, with the decom business and all the traveling I do for that, plus with, with the restaurant. Um, my time is very, very, very scarce. Uh, yeah. I have done a few conferences. I've only booked a couple so far this year, again, because of, of time constraints. And uh, I was asked to hike Mount Everest. Wow. Yeah, That's I'm insane. Yeah. Uh, we're just going to base camp. It was um, a fellow firefighter uh, named Austin Peck, was a Goodyear firefighter, passed away about five months ago. And uh, his uncle has put together an Everest hike to base camp. We're going to carry Austin's helmet, prayers from his mm -hmm. daughters to the monks, and a set of bagpipes up there. Yes. And uh, to honor um, Austin and to, again, bring more awareness to cancer in the fire service. But if anybody would like to uh, reach out to me, they can get me at edc mm -hmm. at firstrespondercon.com. Mm -hmm. um, so edc at firstrespondercon.com. And uh, I'd be happy to, to help out any way that I can. And um, again, my time's a little limited. But uh, yeah, I, I love, my, my passion is people. Yeah, and each one of these businesses that I'm I'm working on have to do with people and that passion. Yeah, what I'm gonna do too is um, so for your your business and all the stuff that you just said, I'll put it in the description. We're gonna put kind of like your Instagram and all that handle okay. like on the, on the video. Um, but for your book, whenever it is released, you can let me know of a link and I'll just update it so that that way if people see this later on, you know, Perfect. they can always go back and see it. So. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. Thanks. Thanks again for being here. Sure. And, uh...